morning, church. Welcome to the Crossing Baptist Church, where we exist to connect you to God, to others, and to your purpose. It's hard for me to follow that. That was pretty, pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. This morning, we'll be sharing from Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there be any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, any affection of mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out. Not only for his own conceits, for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is our privilege to be in your house today. What a, what a blessing it is to gather with your people on this day to worship, to give you praise, honor, and glory, to hear the word preached, to have the freedom to express ourselves in worship, raising hands, lifting our voices to you because you have made everything possible. You have given us salvation, eternal life. You have given us a way to look around and think there's so much sadness right now that we need to look up because our redemption is drawing nigh. It's getting closer. And Father, there's so much hope. The hope is in Jesus. He's the one that's made a way for all of us. We should walk with smiles on our faces, hope in our heart joy to share with others. Father, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for this church. Lord, it is a beacon of light in this community. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for the opportunity I have to be here today. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In your name, amen. So I went to a restaurant. It was two hours and 20 minutes before they closed. I placed my order. And uh, my order included, shocker, sweet tea. I was told, we have no more sweet tea. And I said, hmm, what time do you close? And they said, we close at 11. And we have to make the sweet tea up by the gallon. And it's two and a half hours before we close. And we don't want to waste any sweet tea. And I said, don't worry, I'll take care of it. Just make some sweet tea. They came back a little bit later. The person said, I'm sorry, but we've already cleaned the sweet tea machine. If we make some more sweet tea, we'll have to clean it again. And I said, but you don't close for another two hours and 25 minutes. What if I'm not the only person who comes in wanting sweet tea? And they said, well, we'll tell them the same thing. We've already cleaned it. We're not going to clean it again. We're out of sweet tea. Would you like something else? And I said, my money back. <laughs> and they said, but you've already got your sandwich. You can't have your money back. It was part of the deal. And I said, then I'd like to speak with the manager. The lady said, the manager's the one that told me that we don't make sweet tea after we've cleaned it and I said I'd like to speak with the owner and they said the owner won't be here at, you know we close in two hours so the owner is at home and I said can I have their telephone number and they said certainly so I called the owner and I said I'm here at your fine establishment I'm having a nice dinner with my family it's two hours until we close, but they've already cleaned the sweet tea machine, and they said that they're not going to get me any more tea because they would have to clean it again. Her words were, put so-and-so on the phone. And I said, okay, speaker. And she began to use some very colorful words to describe that that restaurant exists for the customer, not for the worker. 
And if I didn't get sweet tea, they could be looking for another job. And I was like, I like this owner. Now, now hold on a second. Don't get, don't, don't think, well, that preacher's just, he's just, you know, what kind of, I mean, he's got to understand. Those workers, they'll have to run another pot of hot water through the sweet tea maker, and he's just doing all kinds of work for them, and, and he, all he cares about is himself. And my answer to you is, yes. I only wanted sweet tea. That's all I wanted was my sweet tea. And they have a big billboard, sweet tea. <laughs> and this person said, no, that inconveniences me. And because it's an inconvenience to me, you get no sweet tea. <laughs> One day, there's going to be somebody at the gate. They're going to want to come in. They're not going to be allowed to come in because nobody served them. Nobody was inconvenienced by them. Everybody else had their own thing going, and although they had several more years before they died, they didn't want to go out of their way to serve them, so they never shared the gospel with them. And now they're on the outside going, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I want in. I want in. How do I get in? Can I speak to the management? And at that time, the management's going to show up at the gate and say, yes, can I help you? He said, well, I, I wanted to get in. Why didn't somebody help me? Why didn't somebody show me that there's a way to get in? To which the management of heaven is going to turn to the workers and say, guys, don't you get it? It's not about making our lives comfortable. Help me. It's not about having our best life now. Come on. It's not about my preferences and my, my choices and, and what I want. It's not about making sure that everything is good with me. It's about making sure that if there's somebody out there who is on the other side of the counter, we do everything we can while we've got time before we close to do ensure that we help them as much as possible. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, says those very words. Paul says it much more eloquently than I ever could. He says it like this. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, uh, chapter 2. Ooh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Everyone should look out. Look out. That's a really cool word. I'm going to teach you some Greek today, and you're going to like it. Okay? The word look is the Greek word scope. Not the mouthwash. I'm talking about the thing you put on the end of a, uh, of a, of a gun or the thing you point up into the sky to look at the star, stars. That's the word scope. It's pretty cool, isn't it? He's saying you're a distance from them. Pull something out that when you look at it, it pulls them closer to you. Look out for them. A lot of us keep people at our arm's length. Um, have you ever had breakfast or lunch or dinner with somebody and uh, you're sitting there and then you realize they're on Facebook? Happened yesterday. If my family's watching now, it's kind of cool. I have one brother, believe it or not, that is, that is kind of rude, okay? The rest of us have tamed way down. But one brother, he, he still is, he's rough on the edges. And he noticed that one of my nephews was on Facebook while the family was having breakfast. And um, he reached over and grabbed his iPhone and chunked it to the other side of the table and says, Get off your phone. Pay attention to what's going on. You know what, what that uh, nephew did the rest, of the rest of the meal? He sat there and 
sulked looking for that iPhone over there on the other side of the table. He wanted that iPhone. Hey, I'm not faulting him. I'm saying this. We are now at the point in our lives where we have access to everybody and don't want to talk to anybody. We don't want to be bothered by anybody. Hey, you don't think I'm, I'm right? Let somebody knock on your door. Those who do open the, um, answer the door only open it a little bit. I've knocked on every door in this town. I know what I'm talking about. Nobody goes, we got company. Well, I'm telling you, they don't. We got people that will send kids to the door and say, tell them mom and daddy not here. My mom and daddy said they're not here. <laughs> we don't want intrusion. And so we keep others out there as well. He says, I want you to look out for the interest of others. I want you to have your scope out looking, searching for other people's interest, trying to find their interest. I wish with all of my heart, every ounce of the, my body, which is a bunch of ounces, wishes that I could say I've mastered this part. I constantly have to be brought back to, hey, pastor, hey, Rick, you don't need to wait for other people to come knock on your door. You need to look out for them and search ways to serve their interest. Are you that way too? You know, there's two sides of that coin. There's a side that says, don't, hey, don't bother me. And then there's the other side of the coin that says, I wish somebody would. Just notice what I'm going through. Good preaching, He's telling a straight point. Paul is saying, get out your telescope. Now, um, what he is saying here is, it's kind of interesting how he pulls it all together, uh, Pastor. He pulls it all together by saying that it's, you're looking out, and he uses an interesting word in, um, in Galatians, carry one another's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law. Galatians chapter 6, verse, verse 2. Carry one another's burdens, and this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Look out for another's interest. Carry another's burdens. You, people have interest. They have burdens. In Philippians 2.20, Paul says that Timothy, for I have no one else like-minded who will generally care about your interest. All seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Oh, my soul. This passage, Philippians 2, verse 20, look at it. Underline and circle it. I mean, take a, a knife and scribble on your screen there. That word care about is an interesting word. It's the word we get our word bishop from. It means overseer. So follow, follow his, his logic. I want you to look out, scope out other people's interest as an overseer looks at their interest. Paul Bear Bryant, he was a famous football coach from a state down south. That's not mentioned. And um, <laughs> he had a tower put on his football field. He didn't interact with the players. He watched them from his tower. Lou Holtz capitalized on that idea. And so he had a tower built up in Notre Dame. Any Notre Dame fans? Good. And um, <laughs> each week, there was always an article in the local newspaper there in Beach Bend of Indiana? South Bend, South Bend, Indiana. Beach, that's around here, isn't it? Yeah, or not, it's Beach Fork. How did I come up with Beach Bend? Beach Bend's a campground in Tennessee. It's South Bend, Indiana, there you go. So every week there would come out an article there was an anonymous reporter who always wrote about the weaknesses of Notre Dame's players. And for years and years and years and years and years, nobody knew who was writing that report. But they always nailed it. So-and-so was lazy during practice. So-and-so missed 14 tackles during practice. Nobody could figure out who was doing it. When he retired, he said, I did it. 
I was in the tower watching over, and I could see what was going on. Now, you can use, check this, you can use it like you did Paul Bear Bryant, who used his tower to watch how the practice went so that he could help the players. Or you could use it like Lou did to watch the people as they went so that he could criticize the players. It's the same word. I think this is just me speaking. Probably don't have any biblical evidence to support this. That we as Christians have gotten really good at standing above the world, looking at all its problems and criticizing. I think we can point it out in a heartbeat. We even give them names. We talk about them. And we're doing what God says. We're looking out, overlooking, caring for, but in a negative sense instead of the way God intended it to be. If all you can do when you look in the mirror is see your negative self-image, you will become depressed, discouraged, and defeated. But if you can look there, instead of seeing your flaws, you see what God sees, that you're more than a conqueror, that you're a sinner saved by grace, then you'll become the person that God sees you as. If all you can do is look at this world and see the negative as you overlook the world, then that's what this world will become. But when Jesus looked at the world and he, he looked over it, he didn't call them names, he wept for them. He didn't put them down, he looked for a way to pick them up. This is what he's talking about. An overseer is not someone who berates you and beats you. It's someone who carries your burden. Galatians chapter 6 verse 2. We have to fulfill the law of Christ. I've heard it a thousand times. Preacher, we're no longer under the law. My dear friend, yes we are. And the law of Christ is bare one another's burdens. I'll never forget the first time that I heard a preacher say this, and it has hit me so hard and so long I've held on to this as a, as, as a negative banner, something that I keep in my mind constantly. The Christian army, of all the armies in the world, the Christian army is the only army that shoots its wounded. Isn't that horrible? But we do it, don't we? Instead of bearing... The burdens, we bruise the burdened. We beat them, kill them, beat them down. Now, if you don't think that's right, just go out here and mess up and tell somebody. Before you know it, the whole church will know, because we share it with love. Let me just tell you what's happening. Now, this is out of love. So-and-so did this. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, and, and don't let it be a good one because, my goodness, then we all jump in. We add gravy to it. My goodness, this is, this is horrible. If you want to see somebody shot, let's, uh, shot, let somebody find out some of the bad things I've done. Watch how fast it spreads. I didn't say wait until I do bad things. I said find out, okay? Okay, I do bad things all the time. Ask my wife. She'll tell you. This passage right here, reveals why we should bear one another's burdens. This, this, is, this is what it's about. But it tells us in Philippians 2 verse 4, it tells us why we should do it. Isn't that important to know why? I mean, how many of you here believe that if a, if a Christian gets... Uh, gets involved in sin, we ought, to, we ought to help them, be there for them. Amen? Say amen. amen. How many of you believe that if there's somebody out there, they're not a Christian and they're living in sin, we ought to be there for them? Say amen. amen. Why? I'm going to tell you why. This passage sums up why. A little history. In the Old Testament, with the, uh, uh, the gospel presentation in the Old Testament, it's, it always was found its um, biggest expression in the nation of Israel. Are you with me? In the Old Testament, it's all about the nation of Israel, right? And the nation of Israel for 40 years did good stuff and 40 years did bad stuff. 
Okay, but it's always the nation of Israel. They were the chosen ones. They were the, 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 the chosen nation. And the reason they were chosen was not so they could go to heaven, but so that they could share the gospel message with others. You've got to understand what it means to be chosen. Okay? They weren't chosen to go to heaven. They were chosen to share the message. Somebody say amen. I mean, it's a big difference, isn't it? Okay? That means, one means that all of Israel is saved. The other means that all of Israel needs to tell people about God. So was all of Israel saved? Do this. Did Israel need to tell people about God? Do this. So that's what it means to be chosen. Not that Israel went to heaven. As a matter of fact, if the Bible says, man, you think that just because Abraham's your daddy, you get to go, go to heaven? Paul says, that's so wrong. I paraphrased two chapters in Romans, but that's what it means, okay? But there was an idea in the Old Testament of community. The idea in the, in the Old Testament was that all of Israel, the entire nation, worked as a, as a unit. And the, the thinking was nation, 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 nation. Now, something's happening in Christendom that Paul reveals in the book of Philippians. And this is the verse that we've been wanting to get to for the past four weeks. The title of the series is Get It Right the First Time. And this is where we've got to get it right. Remember what it says in Philippians chapter 2, um, verse 1. Everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. And that's our English translation. And as an English reader and speaker, we miss the nuances, but they're there if we think about it. I'm going to say a sentence, and you tell me what the emphasis of that sentence is. You tell me who the focal point is on, okay? Jonathan, take care of your sister. What's the emphasis in that sentence? Help me. There's no right or wrong answer. Jonathan. Jonathan is the emphasis. Jonathan, take care of your sister. Andy, do the dishes. What's the emphasis on that sentence? Is it about somebody do the dishes? Is it about Andy do something? Every sentence in English has the same thing, but we have to use voice inflection in order to get the message across. Well, what if you're writing? How do you do it? Well, the Greeks had a really cool way to do it. One of two ways. In order, by the way, in, in Greek, uh, uh, where you put a word doesn't matter. You can put it anywhere you want. The arrangement of the word, the position of the word, always meant the significance of it. And you could, it's really cool, you could make something, you could emphasize something by putting it at the beginning of a sentence, or you could emphasize it by putting it at the end of the sentence. Those were the two most emphatic positions in a Greek sentence. Really cool, isn't it? Okay? That way when you're reading something, go to the store, Andy. It's at the sentence. Go, Andy, to the store. What's the most important part of that? Go, the store. Cool. Get it? Are you following me? Isn't that cool? That way when you're reading, and, and, and they seriously do that too. They would have store, go, Andy, now. And that's how the Greek reads, and then you have to put it together to make sense out of it. Really cool, right here in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, in the Greek, here's how it reads. Each one, take care of the interest. Don't, each one, don't worry about your own interest, but take care of the other's interest, each one of you. What's the emphasis? Just so you don't miss it, Paul puts it at the beginning 
and he puts it at the end of the sentence. Each one. It's really cool that it's not each one as in when we say each one, it's always singular. Each one of them. Paul does something weird here too. Not only does he put it at the beginning of the sentence, he says, look out, each one of you, not for your own interest, but for the interest of others, each one. He puts each one at the beginning, and then he make and at the end, just in case you're wondering which word he's trying to emphasize, and then he makes it plural, which in English doesn't make much sense. But to, it's, follow me, to take something that each one, and then to make it plural, actually focuses on the singularity of the subject. Each one of you is talking about all of you, correct? Each ones of you, each ones of you, is talking about the singularity of all of you, individually. Follow me. He's changing a concept. This is a watershed moment in the writings of Paul. They call it the many ethical, many, M-I-N-I, many ethical treatise of Paul. It's the point in which the community is no longer that which is the importance in Christendom, but the individual is now the importance. It's no longer about the nation of Israel, but it's about the citizen of Israel. He is saying something here that is blowing our minds. We have stood back and watched. Now we need to telescope in close and look at the nation, not from a bird's eye view of getting the whole thing, but zeroing in on the one person and identifying that one person and not worrying about the needs of the community, not trying to take care of the community, but now take care of the needs of the individual. Do you see the difference? The gospel message is not about saving the community. The gospel message is about saving the individual. I wrote something. I want to read this again. Let me see if I wrote it down over here. Um, man, I wrote it down on a sheet of paper, and I, I think I didn't put it down here. Um, but I'll remember it. I should have written it in my notes, but I forgot to. But I'll remember it, even though I forgot Two things give us a clue. The fact that he re repeats each one, each one. Repetition means something in the scripture. And also, not just repetition, but also the emphatic positioning of each one. The beginning and the end. Okay? Here's what he's saying. Let me try to sum it up. Each one of us come to know Christ alone but not by ourselves. Summing this up, the teachings that are found in here, found in verse 20, found in Galatians 6, uh, 1 Corinthians and, and Romans, a couple other passages, it means this, we come to Christ alone, individually, but not by ourselves. It's collective. And what he's saying here is that the biggest burden, the largest care, the thing that we should see more than anything else is we should see the individual when presenting the gospel. 
God cast a wide net over this world that includes everybody in this world when he gives the gospel presentation. And God's gospel presentation is simply this. Come, all who are weak and weary, come. All who are heavy laden, come. It's, it's huge. It's, the gospel presentation is, is huge. It's, it's, it's all. The last words in your Bible that, that the Holy Spirit speaks are simply this. Come. The words of the bride, the last word that the church says in your Bible is this. Come. And the invitation is, is to all. It's to everybody. It's collectively to every single one of us. Yet there is a time. There is a, a, a point. There is a... a, a, a an event in our life in which it's, it's telescoped in on you. A time when the Holy Spirit hones in on you and your life and where you are and your concerns and your cares and, and what you're going through. And at that point, he's, he's zeroing, zeroing in, telescoping, get it? 100% looking not at the stars of the heaven, but the star. Not of the masses but of the one zeroed in. He puts it this way. I know when a sparrow dies. I see you. He doesn't see the hair on your head. That's kind of cool. He sees the individual hairs on your head. But yet he sees every head collectively. And he's telling us, have, he's about to say these words, have this mind in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. He's telling us all to come together and changing everything. It's not about the masses going. It's about the one. Just the one. And that's why I can stand boldly and proclaim that if you were the only person to ever receive him as Savior, he would have died on the cross just for you. Because I believe that the Bible teaches that we, when he died on the cross, he did die individually for every single one of us. In this same text, when you have a burden, he wants to zero in on your burden as if there's nobody else in the world that has a burden. And that's what Christ is telling us. He's not saying don't neglect the fact that you have concerns. No, no, no. The word also is there, okay? Look also at the others, okay? But prioritize them. Make sure that you look to them. And so this morning, I want you to know something. I want you to hear this. You've got two telescopes on you right now. One is from heaven. And that rascal has zoomed in on you, and he is seeing every single thing there is to see about you. Isn't that cool? Isn't that an awesome thing to think of? That he absolutely has zero. I, I mean, he, he could stand back and see the whole blue marble thing, but he has zeroed in. He's come through the clouds, through the rain clouds, heading our way again, through this, uh, the ceiling down through the gravel and, and, and through this and through this black foam we have painted all the way down, and he is looking right now, or right at you, into the very soul, your very soul, and he sees every concern you got. You scared about something? You scared about your job? Are you upset because of a relationship that's gone bad? He sees it. He sees right into it. I mean, he knows that you're hurting. He sees the physical things that's going on in your life. He can actually see that. The, the rest of the world is now gone because he's looking at you. You got another telescope on you too. That telescope is owned by people who care for you and they love, for, love you. And that telescope is zoomed in on you. Isn't it awesome to be part of a church where you know you're under watch care? Amen. Praise the Lord. I confess. Sometimes I have my telescope set up, but I don't look at it enough. I'll confess it. Sometimes I, I know you're hurting, and I don't, I don't let you know because I don't look at that telescope enough. I'll confess that the Bible clearly teaches me to be more concerned about others than yourself individually. And I, I apologize. It's 
Some of you got a phone call yesterday, didn't you? Worst thing about ever preaching is that the Holy Spirit always convicts me of everything I'm going to say. So I called some of you yesterday because I was going down the street and it's like, you hypocrite, you hypocrite, you hypocrite. And I'm like, leave me alone. I'll just preach what the Bible says and forget what I do. You hypocrite, you hypocrite, you hypocrite. That's all I could hear, you hypocrite. And it's like, man, it's not that I don't love folks. I'll just be honest with you. It's just sometimes I pull back and I pray for people and I don't let them know that I'm looking at them. And I apologize. And I thank you for being understanding. And I hope and pray beyond a shadow of a doubt that you know Jesus Christ will never do that to you. He'll never take his eyes off of you. He'll never do it. And the, the, the worst situation to be in is to be someone who wants to have the telescope because you're crying out and find out that nobody's looking at the telescope. Nobody's looking. You cry out to God and you know He's there, but I belong to the crossing and <laughs> nothing. You've been there. You've been there. You've needed someone and nobody has been there. I know you have. I'm asking you to forgive the crossing. And I'm asking you also to seal in your heart that it won't happen to anybody else. I had a meeting, a staff meeting a while back, and that came up. And so it broke my heart that there have been, there have been people in our church that are Miss Church, and, and I, I've done nothing. I contacted a few and found out that not many of us have done much when somebody's missed. And so I got together with Tweety Flesher, and Tweety and I came up with an idea. Tweety knows everybody by name. Tweety knows everything there is to know about you. You meet Tweety one time, and she can remember everything that's ever happened in your life. She'll tell you where you work, what time you work. She, she, she's amazing. So I met with her. I mean, that's a spiritual gift, in my opinion. I was probably not listed anywhere, but knowing everything about everybody has got to be a spiritual gift. I forget people's names. I forgot that guy's name while ago. Um, Will. And uh, see, I remembered it. I knew it would. Um, we came up with an idea. Let me tell you our idea. Here's what we've been doing. I made a list of everybody in the church that comes. Whether you're a member or not, people who come. And... Um, Tweety, at some point, will put a check by people who miss. And then she will text me the people's names who miss, and I will put it on my sheet, people who miss. Okay, we started this uh, two Sundays ago. And so last Sunday, she did it again. So what I did was I looked at people who had missed two weeks in a row. Yesterday, I had my sheet. People that had missed two weeks in a row. I said, hmm. Two weeks in a row. First week you miss, you get a letter from Tweety, a note card from Tweety. Isn't that cool? I'm going to miss one Sunday just because I like her cards. Okay? She sends some good cards. Okay? Uh, the second week, if you miss two weeks in a row, uh, I'm going um, to find out what's going on. A lot of people miss one week, and, you know, like the Fleshers are not here today, the Merritts are not here today, Rumfields are not here today. Egan's are not here today. Um, you know, and I, I pretty much know where they are and what's going on. You know, stuff like that. And um, Jonathan and Sarah Brewster are not here today. They sent me a text. But, you know, kinda, I kind of know where I was telling the, uh, uh, our band. I said, well, this morning at 730, I was like, my phone's going up. People are telling me where they are. I said, nobody's going to be here. Everybody's gone. Okay? So if you miss one week, you get a card. Miss two weeks, you get a phone call. If you miss three weeks, you get a visit from me. You miss four weeks, we send out the FBI. Amen. <laughs> Here's what I'm offering you. You ready for this? You want to be in that list? 
of people who receive the text. So that you can have a list and you can check and say, oh my goodness, Karen and Alan hadn't been here. You might not even know who Karen and Alan are. Shame on you. Okay? Where's Les today? Les wasn't here last Sunday either. Les was here the week before, but now this is two weeks in a row. Les hadn't been here. Terry and Amy, two weeks in a row. They haven't been here. I wouldn't have known that if we hadn't started doing that. Because I looked at the list yesterday and was like, hmm, hmm. Les, Les wasn't here last week. Hmm, he wasn't here this week. Hmm, maybe it's because we took him out to eat. <laughs> the food was nasty. I ain't going back to that church. <laughs> they go to nasty places. You want to receive that text? I want you to. Scripture says, if you're going to get it right the first time, bear one another's burdens. Put a telescope on everybody and find out what's going on. What's the number one way to keep healthy? Somebody tell me. Eat right. That's right. You're a good, brilliant preacher. What is the number one thing that you should do every single day if you want to keep a doctor away? Drink lots of water. Not drink lots of water. <laughs> An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Have you ever heard that before? You have? Okay. Do you eat an apple a day? No way. No way. <laughs> I know it's good for me, and I'm still not going to do it. You know why they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away? Do you, you understand why? Because, here's why, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Okay? It's easy to do. Okay? And if something is easy to do, it is also easy to not do. Okay? All right. You with me? What is the number one reason that people eventually drop out of church? Number one reason. I'm going to tell you. Don't have to guess. I'll tell you. Because nobody cares. Nobody cares. What's the easiest thing to do? Let somebody know you care. So easy. Send a text. Call. Go by a visit. Put a balloon on their door. Throw a rock through their window. Something to let them know you're thinking about them. It's the easiest thing to do to let somebody know. That which is easy to do is also easy not to do. It's the last day in February, and it stops now. I've asked for your forgiveness for the past. I've challenged you by giving you scriptural reason. I just gave you a social reason. I'm appealing to your empathy, your sympathy, and also to your desire that the community of Christ grows and that today... It stops. I'm going to tell you, you have more influence than I do, by the way. If I call somebody, they're like, well, there's the preacher he's supposed to. You know, it would rock their world if you called them. Hey, I really don't know you, but um, we got a list here, and it says that you haven't been in two weeks, and I just want you to know that um, I'd like to get to know you. That'd be really cool. My name is, is Juanita. I, I'm the one that uh, they call me Pistol Packing Mama back in the old Out Wayne, and uh, I raise goats and chickens. And you know, if you want to come over, we have some dumplings uh, or squirrel stew. I mean, we can do this. Amen. I, if I got that phone call, I'd show up to see who that Juanita girl was, wouldn't you? <laughs> Amen. And if y'all didn't know all that stuff about her, that's pretty cool, right? Because I just pretty well described you to a T. You're not cooking? <laughs> we'll go out to eat at Bob Evans or somewhere. Listen, it, it, it can be a blessing. So I'm asking, here's the invitation. Go ahead, uh, y'all guys. Uh, uh, here, here's the invitation. It's kind of cool. The invitation is because um, I expect to see uh, a lot of brokenness during this invitation. 
Uh, I had my brokenness yesterday going uh, 72 miles an hour down Bluegrass Parkway. Um, simply by saying, God, I haven't done enough. I haven't had my focus where my focus needs to be. I've been focused on my family and me. And it's time I realized that the Bible doesn't say take care of mine. It says take care of his. Got to preach. And today it stops. Whether you're 16 or 60 or 90, it doesn't matter. Today it stops. Get involved. Second category. Those are the people who need to be who need to repent. Change your life, change your mind, change what you do. There's another category. Those are the people who need to be revived. You've been through some tough times and your church hadn't been there. You would do us a favor. You would do the kingdom of God a favor. By just saying, I'm hurt. You can do that many different ways. You can take somebody in this church and just say, hey, put me on that list. I know I'm here today, but I want to be on that list. Or say, hey, Let's grab coffee. Or you could just walk up to the preacher and say, man, y'all messed up. And if anybody defends themselves, let me know, and I'll slap them around and say, no, let's, let's, no. If we mess up, we've messed up. See, I believe the Holy Spirit's going to start some healing in our church. And I believe it's going to start with you, no matter which side of that fence you're on, which side of that, that concern you're on. Because today, God is telling us to come down out of that tower and go on the field, out there with the rest of those football players, and get, there, get down there with them and be in the game with them. Father, I pray, God, that, Lord Jesus, you, you, you start the healing and all those who come to you to repent, Father, that you say, well done, good, glad, yes, finally. Now let's go. And Father, you, 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 you take our brokenness and you use it. And all those who, who have felt abandoned, they felt alone, they felt unmissed, that God, you would heal their heart today. And they would accept the apology of the church because that's not how the community is supposed to be. And today they would find healing and a fullness. And God, they would know of your presence and how you love them. So Father, I pray, Lord, during this time, you just have your way with us and do whatever you want. We're your community. We're your family. In your name I pray, Christ. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's stand together. We're about to take up our tithes and offerings, so if you need to prepare for that in any way, please feel free to do so now. And I also want to take a moment and thank those who are already given online or through the app. So reading through some old stories, biblical ones, <laughs> um, and I got to the one about the widow's might. And I'm sure half of you already know where I'm going with this, but... I think the last time I actually read that was something like Sunday school when I was you know, back with Kristen and Sarah I, not y'all but you get what I mean and I hadn't really thought about it much but the the weird thing is we tend to focus really hard on the guys who give all the money and, and Jesus kind of rejects but couldn't have helped but notice that the reason why wasn't, you know, the amount of money wasn't good enough. I, I think it was more along the lines of, you know, I'm, I'm God. All the money in the world is nothing. 
If you're an infinite God, what is a finite amount of money? But it was the attitude that they gave it. They were, they were bold walking up to it, and they wanted every coin to clink in the plate. Was, was the image that I got. Was it, it wasn't about that, the act of giving. It was the recognition for the giving. And then this widow comes in and quietly just places it and walks away. And that's the one he calls attention to. Not because of the amount, but because of the attitude and the act of this is for you, not for me and everybody to see. I don't think she planned that day to be made an example out of. <laughs> but she was the perfect example because she had nothing and she gave it all away. Amen. So as our volunteers come forward, give with the right attitude. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Help us to focus.